Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at least on my review of Strange Meeting by Susan Hill. Um, so, Susan Hill I mostly know as like the author of like ghost novels, um, but this is set in the First World War and it's very much a novel of like the relationship between two people, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do my usual, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... Things don't happen like this often in a lifetime. John Hilliard, a young subaltern returning to the Western Front after a brief period of sick leave back in England, blind to the horrors of the trenches, finds his battalion tragically altered. His commanding officer finds escape in alcohol, there is a new adjutant, and even Hilliard's Batman has been killed. But there is David Barton, as yet untouched and unsullied by war, radiating charm and common sense, forever writing long letters to his family. Theirs is a strange meeting and a strange relationship, the coming together of opposites in the summer lull before the inevitable storm. And before I actually get into the story, I want to read um, this little bit, which is actually from the afterword, because this helps you to put a lot of it into context and gives you an idea of what you're getting into as well. So, uh, and this was written in 1989, the afterword was. When was a book written? Let's have a look. First published in 1971. So Hill says, among the questions I am often asked about strange meeting, two recur most frequently. The first is, were Hilliard and Barton homosexual? Was their relationship a fulfilled and physical one? The second is, what would have happened to them after the war? Um, and she says, such questions always presuppose that a novelist knows more about her characters than the reader, and that those characters somehow could have an independent existence outside the confines of the novel and what actually happens in it. And of course they could not. I think it is rather unprofitable to wonder what happened to people who never existed, but for the record, I did not intend the conclusion to be drawn that Barton and Hilliard had a physical relationship, though I suppose if they had it would not greatly alter anything else that happens to or between them in the book. David Barton seems to me the sort of open, generous, warm and loving young man who would have easily formed bonds of friendship and love with a number of people, male and female, as they appeared in his life. He does not seem to be especially clearly or unalterably gay, nor really does Hilliard. But he is a much more tormented and confused young man and perhaps would later have found relationships with women more difficult to achieve, always assuming he would have wanted to achieve them. And of course the climate of their times was so very different, the pressure upon young men to conform would have been much greater. So with that in mind you can kind of, you could read, read it as a gay love story or it could be a platonic love story between two men. Um, and I don't, as, I, as she says, I don't think it really alters the reading either way, so that's up to you, you know. So he talks about his trick to stay awake, um, and I have done this trying to get to sleep, so perhaps it's no wonder that I never sleep, he says. The trick was to order yourself to be dead asleep by the time you counted 10 or 20. Then you couldn't do it, you stayed awake for as long as you wanted, 10, 15, 20. Go to sleep! Though perhaps when he was a child in this room, he had never, in fact, wanted it to be so very long. Only wanted time enough to see the guests who were coming to dinner, or hear the owl begin to hoot in the trees at the bottom of the drive. Once he stayed awake for the arrival of his mother's cousin, who was a missionary in Africa, and who had been, after all, an ordinary woman in a dull green dress, who had been nothing, seen from two floors through the stairway, who bore no traces of Africa. And we get this while he's back visiting his family. Um, Perhaps it'll be alright now, you've had your wound, so you're not due for another. He thought that she believed it. I don't think it works like that. I don't think it does either. We get a reference to a copy of The Turn of the Screw and the complete works of Sir Thomas Brown. Turn of the Screw, great novel. And um, here Hilliard is uh, being told what happened. And I think this last little paragraph's very revealing of one of the characters, but just an interesting line as well. I've seen nothing like it, nothing. Not that we were the only ones. They went mad, we might have been a pack of schoolboys in a scrum. Did you hear about the jocks? Most of them went straight onto the wire. They were on our right, we watched it. The sun was shining, you could see for miles, even through the smoke, we just watched them go. We lost Percy and 38 men all in one go. I'd just gone down there, I saw them. God alone knows what was supposed to be going on, I didn't. I haven't found out yet, none of us knows. I suppose it's all on paper somewhere. Nothing came through to us at all, everything went to blazers, telephones, runners. Half the artillery blew themselves up with their own Lewis guns backfiring because somebody hadn't attended to them properly. Most of Parkinson's lot went up with a mine. There was a barrage they didn't tell us about and we couldn't get word through to them to stop. We were running into our own covering fire. And then they started to shoot machine guns from the left flank. They'd lost their bearings, they thought we were Bosch. Not surprising. After an hour or so you couldn't see a thing. It was a day and a half, two days of absolute bloody chaos, bloody pointless mess. Hilliard realised that this was what had upset his careful lawyer's mind more than anything else, this lack of order and reason. 
the mess. So one of the characters here, he points out, and this is something I always kind of feel sad about when I watch documentaries and things. They have no right to make horses suffer in a war, not the way those did. They don't choose to come out here, do they? All I do is try not to think about it so much. It bothers me thinking about it, sir. There was also a thing, I think it was called the Great Pet Massacre. Basically during the Second World War, when it looked like rationing was going to come in, the British government was basically providing instructions on how you could euthanise your pets if there wasn't enough food to go around. And they were meant to just be instructions for if there was a famine essentially, but it was a crazy number of people um, when, and, when it killed their animals. Let's have a look. Uh, British Pet Massacre, World War II. Yeah, it's called the British Pet Massacre. Uh, an event in 1939 in the UK where over 750,000 pets were killed in preparation for food shortages. Biggie, you hear that? If there's a food shortage... <coughs> Only kidding, I will not kill my cat under any circumstances. I'll kill you before I kill my cat. So Hilliard, they see this German um, in a plane, dead German. The pilot was still strapped into his seat, but he had slid forward and down. His head was bent over to one side and the eyes were open, looking over in the direction of the trees. He had a plump, young face with high cheekbones, and the flesh of it was quite undamaged. His front teeth protruded slightly to rest on the bottom lip, but Hilliard saw that the rest of his body, up to the chest and arms, was almost burned away. He wondered why the plane had not gone up in flames completely, and, as it had not, why the man could not have scrambled out. And he says, uh, This was the first dead man he had seen since his return from France, and there would now only be all the rest who were to follow. There's a bit of foreshadowing there as well. I just thought this was interesting, I assume this is true as well, but some just some, I mean data, I like data and stats. The length of an average march under normal conditions for a large column is 15 miles a day. Infantry usual pace, yards per minute 100. Minutes required to traverse one mile, 18. Miles per hour, including short halts, 3. And I wanted to read this because whoever owned this before me, I got this at a charity book exchange at the local hospital when I was getting my blood test. And somebody's highlighted this this section. Um, they seem to have acknowledged stuff that is about um, Barton and Hilliard's love for each other. So we've got, he shook his head and in a second of absolute clarity, he saw that nothing mattered except Barton and what he felt for him. That he loved him as he'd loved no other person in his life. The reason for this and the consequences of it were irrelevant. The war was irrelevant, something for them to get through. Nothing else could be truly important again, nothing else. Acknowledging this for the first time, he felt as though his head had been rinsed through with clear water, and he was no longer perturbed. He had seen and accepted it all. Everything else was far away. He looked down at the pile of ammunition returns on the table in front of him, at the black lead pencil and the box of matches, at his own hand. And then the fear hit him again, broke over him like nausea. If Barton were killed, what would he do? What would he do? So another little passage that whoever owned this before highlighted, um... Yet now he seemed to come alive for Glazier, more than at any time during the past week. He talked with something of his old teasing manner, laughed, so that Hilliard, a pace behind, felt jealousy rising in him. He began to hate Glazier, but hated David too for giving so much of himself away so freely to another. He thought, what has Glazier got? What does he say or do that I cannot? What spring has he managed to touch? And I like this because this is kind of a nod to Susan Hill herself writing her ghost stories. It says, The men tell one another they have seen spectres and dead Germans rising up, and although nobody believes it, there is a fashion for telling these rather crude ghost and horror stories just now. It's amazing how many people can produce a tale of haunting when called upon. Another bit that this person highlighted, Captain Franklin is imperturbable, as cool as a cucumber, very efficient which the men also respect. They know he isn't going to lose his head. John says he may have a head to lose, but certainly not a heart. I wonder. So that's from an excerpt of one of, um, what's his name's letters? What was his name? Forgotten already. David Barton, one of Barton's letters home. He's talking about the books because his, his family have sent uh, Barton some books to the front line. He says, the Japanese anthology of, of which I manage a paragraph every night before my eyes close, which they do too easily, is beautiful. That world seems even farther off, full of cherry blossoms and reeds and still water, snow and wise thoughts. I find I can read absolutely anything, or could if time permitted, and soak it up and it only refreshes me, whereas music has become almost impossible. And we get this great conversation, which is obviously very prescient. I mean, Hill's writing with the benefit of hindsight, but you know. Um, by, this, by the next war, the message will have got through. There will never be another war. There will always be wars. Men couldn't be so stupid, John. After all this, isn't the only real purpose of our being here to teach them that lesson, how bloody useless and pointless the whole thing is? Men are naturally stupid and they do not learn from experience. You haven't much faith in humanity. Collectively, no. Individually? Oh yes, you've only to look around you here. I think I'm the same. I have no faith in humanity collectively, but I do have faith in individuals. And we get this bit here. Um, this is the worst bit, this building up of tension. Like the dentist. 
rather a pale analogy, but yes. And uh, I can appreciate that because I'm booked in next month. I'm going to get a root canal and I've had root canals before. They're not fun. And then at the end, we get a reference to some books again. The Collected Works of Sir Thomas Brown, uh, The Turn of a Screw, The Turn of the Screw by Henry James and a novel called A Room with a View by Mr. Forster. So yeah, it's a very literary book. It's really interesting to read. I'm just kind of interested in uh, the First and Second World Wars in general, so that kind of helped. Um, it's not like necessarily high octane with lots of action. It's very much about the relationships between these two characters and the war is just sort of the backdrop and the situation in which they meet. Um, but yeah, very worth reading. I gave it a strong 3.5 out of 5. Would recommend. And it was nice to read something by Susan Hill that was a little different to a ghost story, even though I love her ghost stories. So there we have it, that's what I made of Strange Meeting by Susan Hill. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.